Hi, everyone. Welcome to the debate, which we are calling it as Unplugged Debate. And in this debate, we are going to talk about how do we decode the talent strategies in DCCs and what is the new next in workforce practices. Now, when we talk about GCCs, one of the biggest things which is most relevant today is um, everyone's talking about the talent shortage. Everyone seems to say, hey, we don't, uh, we're not able to hire as per the numbers that we have. And then there are other issues relating to the employee engagement. And also people are talking about the great resignation that seemed to have started during the COVID time uh, back in the US last year. Uh, but we also seem to be uh, having its, uh, its effect here in uh, India. So my question to all my panelists uh, uh, would be, uh, what is really happening? How do you view the current talent shortage? And how do you think the industry at large could address some of these gaps? I would like to request uh, Raghav, if you can start with, and then we'll go to Vijay and Naveen. Th thank you, TV. So I think for me, the answer is uh, down to two simple reasons. Reason number one is Reliance Geo. So what you will see is that the new workforce that has come, they got access to internet when they were pretty young. And that access was not few MBs, it was in GBs. There was no limit to the internet they could get. So they're not like your typical Indians who wanted to work in jobs for 10, 12 years and where job security was a big thing. For these new folks, the Gen Z, for them, it is all about what am I giving and what am I getting in return? So that's the first thing. Second thing is obviously the COVID pandemic. Uh, as we could see that in, in terms of analytics, in terms of digital transformation, there was a huge shift. That shift accelerated. And there was a demand and supply gap. And whenever there is a demand and supply gap, we all know what happens. The price increases. And that's what happened here. A new company is a lot of, they wanted to be competitive. They started doing that. So I think to solve this, uh, I think for global GCCs, the difference would be they should treat their employees not like Indian employees. They should treat them like global employees where they know that these are not like your typical Indian employees. They understand what they are doing and their pay, their compensation should be treated not in a services manner, more in a product manner. Well, that's a very interesting thought, Raghav. You are uh, talking about uh, the issues are not just relating to the external factors alone, but really how do we, it all boils down to how do we treat our people? Do we treat them well, respectfully and so on? Uh, so that would also be my segue to you, Vijay. In addition to the point that uh, we talked about and Raghav said, how do you look at some of these uh, uh, some of these issues relating to the basic issues of treating people or employees at par or um, do, do you think there is a there is a sense of treating people differently between uh, the headquarters versus the bcc yeah sure so um you know tb to the original question uh, i i, I kind of categorize it in three obvious ways right so we have problems across acquiring talent uh sort of growing talent and when i mean growing talent it's about uh, giving them different opportunities, giving them meaningful opportunities, et cetera, and then retaining talent, right? Uh, while that has been the challenge in the general industry, as far as GCCs are concerned, the external environment has changed a little bit, right? Uh, and I'll talk about three major variables that have changed in the last few years. So firstly, most GCCs are now moving from being a cost-only model to a value model, right? Um, so there are very few GCCs right now which would stand up and say, come to India because, you know, of the cost angle. All of them would talk about the kind of talent that we have in India. So that's changed tremendously over the last few years. That is one part of it. The second part is the competition part of it. Uh, if you go back about seven, ten years, uh, the amount of GCCs in India weren't that many. But now it's mushrooming by the day, right? So the amount of competition has increased tremendously. And therefore, the onus is on, I guess, the GCCs themselves to do, uh, to go above and beyond to sort of retain talent. The third thing that has happened is the growth of digital overall, which has been accelerated by COVID. So the kind of talent that you require in order to be a digital first organization is something that hopefully you would find easily in India. So given these three variables, um, you know, we've moved away from, in my mind, good pay, good job security, great office, et cetera, uh, to more uh, you know, meaningful things like, what are you giving me um, as an employer in terms of work? What is my career path? Uh, you know, am I making a meaningful difference to the company, et cetera? And that's the shift that we are seeing. Some GCCs are doing a great job in terms of tackling that, while some others are struggling. With this. Great perspective, Vijay. Naveen, would love to uh, hear your thoughts on the same. 
yeah tv as being the last speaker in this entire thing i think all the points were very well covered already uh, and as uh, raghav and vijay talked about the causes as to what has led to this phenomenon of great resignation uh, it's globally impacted almost every other organization and if i just play back my my and, and been in the industry for almost close to 3 decades now and uh, when i look at it it's totally a change from an employer centric model to an employee centric model and that's that's it's it's and it's for the good and and uh, uh, and that change is visible it's it's a it's a paradigm shift that's taken place right and uh, vijay did allude as to uh, what are the things that we are doing and what we need to do to really grapple with this uh, problem and i would i mean uh, uh, vijay put it in three categories i had I had formed my mind more around first is retain and second is recruit right so if i look at this retention is probably even more important than getting i would i would put more weightage in terms of retaining my talent because they've been with uh, with us they've been a part of a team they understand the organization culture put in the right kind of con- uh, focus with them start having conversations identify the right kind of talent have conversations build out a career path be able to make sure that you are able to give them what they are looking for and i think the underlying message that i'm getting now and it's and it's really uh, it's important for us to all understand it's not only about the wage anymore it's it's an important it's a decision maker but not the only thing they're looking at many other things like what is my culture what is my growth path what all are you giving me more than how how do i get a healthy work life balance and so on so it's it's the the workforce today knows that they are valuable and they are asking for what they truly believe is the right so what we really need to see is that we are really now navigating through uncharted territory and there's no fixed playbook that i could say oh i used this 10 years back i used this 20 years back let me apply that same rule set over here there's a lot of things that we need to real look and uh, the, uh, at least i've seen some places where um, uh, th- there is there is a talent and they are saying that i want to stay back here but i'm getting a better opportunity can you help me by probably giving me either a, a, cl- a clear path or even an increase in wage and hr at that point is to say i'm sorry this is setting a bad trend i cannot do this because uh, what will others they have to go as per the normal and what they do is they lose the talent and then they spend another few months get the other talent you have to get them into the culture so we have to change our mindset we cannot play by the old playbook and we have to evolve as we go into this game no thanks i mean i i i especially like the focus that you are giving on the retention part uh, we sometimes get so carried away by the by the whole idea of uh, having new opportunities but then the the fact that we already have so many uh, employees already in our teams uh, and they are they they might be facing challenges and i think if we are focusing on them and enabling them that could be definitely a great starting point for us because if as we say in medicine prevention is better than cure probably if we are able to take care of retention much better then i think we will have more lesser problems probably downstream there Uh, but let me also go to another question and go a little more upstream uh, because in uh, our industry is still very young relatively and uh, for a lot of companies the young uh, force that's coming out of the colleges uh, is is almost always a great starting point there so what i would like to understand is that on one hand we see hundreds and thousands i mean we, when we look at the data uh, there are literally millions of engineering graduates uh, coming out every year and on the other hand when we talk to people they say i am not we are not able to meet our hiring targets we are not able to find the right quality of people uh, and and then the common refrain is that hey the new college grads are not ready for the industry uh, and we we talk of some kind of an invisible gap between campus to the corporate and and what have you now i would like to ask you a question and this time maybe we'll start from you navin so that you you uh, we, we we will keep rotating the strikes um, what is your view in uh, what is your sense of the real issue there uh, is there a disconnect Uh, or if there is a disconnect where is the disconnect and how could we address that i think you are on mute navin sorry sorry dev yeah so uh, just a segue from the previous uh, point that we were discussing the great resignation i think has significantly impacted more from a lateral standpoint and i think what you are talking right now is more from uh, a fresh I an mean, entry graduate and that's where we're looking at how do we how do they become a part of our workforce right and in my experience across various organizations as we look at this fresh entry right i see two different distinct types of people who are coming in right one is there's a there's a breed who's absolutely clear what they want 
they're probably already set out. They know exactly what their requirements are, the skills that they need to build. They've taken part in hackathons. They have done internships at multiple places. And these kind of people are all set and it and it's almost fully formed in a way from day one to be imbibed into the workforce and probably start producing, right? But not all probably maybe uh, in that manner. So there are also people who have probably looked at it and coming and they have a fair idea. So I think what we need to do as uh, as an organization who's getting in this new workforce is to provide the right kind of opportunities for them also to be uh, uh, to be to be uh, to get the right kind of fitness to be able to contribute as part of this team. So a few things which we do is get the right kind of uh, we have a buddy system. We get we once a person comes in, you spend some time get on the job training along with them. We also uh, have uh, orientation courses which uh, we conduct for them, which is quite elaborate, understanding the culture, understanding the requirements, everything which is there. We also do encourage them to get into a lot of certifications and so many other things so that they start becoming a, a, an integrated part of the workforce so they can start contributing to the teams and becoming valuable uh, part of the whole organization. No, I think that's uh, it's great that you, you brought out the whole idea of body system and certifications and as a mechanism and i think the whole idea of culturization is a very important one as you rightly called because a lot of times we focus on the very tangible uh, sort of things but we don't really focus on the core of the company because that's what is really making us true professionals and not just merely workers in a, in, in some sense i think that's a very good point there um, which i would like to continue your what are your thoughts on that Sure, I think I think just building on what uh, Naveen kind of called out. So first of all, I think it's a case of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Uh, so why does it happen? Uh, it really happens because I would probably put the biggest blame on us because we are quite comfortable hiring talent from other companies as compared to hiring talent from you know colleges and you know tier two cities, tier three cities, etc. It's it's more a comfort or uh, you know should I say laziness uh, from that perspective. For me, it's much easier to hire from Naveen's team than uh, than sort of spend the time, effort, money, etc. to hire from somewhere else, right? So that is one part of it. Uh, but there are other reasons too. The second reason is uh, curriculum, um, and I think we've we've talked ad nauseum about the fact that some of the curriculum is probably not as relevant. And again, I would put the blame back on us uh, as the industry because we probably are not doing enough to spend time with sort of colleges, training institutes, etc., to kind of give them guidance on what works, what doesn't work, etc. So, so that is the second thing. If the curriculum is set right, you're probably getting that ready-made talent that I was talking about in point number one. Now, when it comes to GCCs, there are two other things that make a big difference in my mind, as compared to let's say, for example, uh, you know, Indian companies and stuff like that. So two great things, two big things, uh, which are more on the softer side of things. One being the context part of it. So remember, uh, most of these companies have their motherships in countries which are thousands of miles away. And one of the key expectations for you as an employee is to pick up the context part of it, right? Now it's easier said than done. Um, and in some cases, for instance, some of these businesses don't even exist in India. I'll give you an example. I used to work for Lowe's before this. Lowe's is a home improvement company. It's the world's second largest home improvement company, but there is nothing like that in India. So for someone to come in, understand that context, and then apply the skills that he has to apply to solve a problem is a little bit of a daunting task to start with. So therefore, companies have to provide that kind of support to start with, right? And the fourth skill to me that is very, very relevant is communication skills, uh, because in a GCC, you are expected to partner with your colleagues from, you know, all around the world, right? And uh, technical skills aside, uh, what makes the big difference in terms of whether they like you, want to work with you, accept your recommendation, etc., is how you tell the story in terms of what you work on. Uh, and therefore, for me, those four aspects need to kind of come together for this to be successful. So, uh, thanks, Vijay. I think those are great perspectives. The fact that you took it so uh, point blank and said we are uh, uh, we are probably very comfortable and you even used the another word for that uh, in just hiring it and probably uh, that could be a culprit because we are not willing to spend a lot of effort on really grooming somebody 
uh, and we we tend to conveniently forget that somebody gave us a chance to begin with from a zero to one and that's why we are here in the industry after all these years and i think we sometimes tend to forget it i want to take it to raghav because raghav is doing something very interesting in this space uh, and he's obviously not only looking at uh, the whole idea that vijay you talked about in terms of grooming and preparing the tier two tier three talent probably he's also looking at it from a curriculum point of view and saying hey what are really those tangible gaps where people are saying that hey they don't know about communication skills or they don't know about data structures or they don't know about xyz raga what has been your experience in terms of the original problem statement and how how do you see uh, some of the things that you are trying to do how is it right. helping in addressing the gap there both from the point of view of, because it's a two sided marketplace both from the gcc point of view as well as from the individual concerned that they feel more confident and they feel they can take on the 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 employment uh, opportunities in the gcc world sure i think uh, coming starting from the fresher view point what you will realize is that the current ugca ecosystem right is extremely bureaucratic in nature it has a lot of hierarchies in place like for example the pay commission colleges are not allowed to pay more than a certain amount to their professors number 2 to, to pass or change any curriculum you have to go through multiple levels which take on an average 18 to 24 months to pass so what has happened is even though these universities have the right minds they are acting in a very reactive way and that is why you see a lot of innovation happening from ed tech companies because there they take decisions very fast they tweak the curriculums very fast so what we are doing is right now with two universities for fresher talent we are training 1100 students as we speak where in semester three semester six and semester eight we provide them four four month long internships in companies which are designed as a part of their curriculum and adding to what vijay was saying right the once they graduate companies are looking for experience so how can we get them experience before they graduate that is what we are working on and if if i had to give a very simple answer to it in the beginning i think uh, universities should partner with private companies that can accelerate this process in long term i would say that the government with respect to the new education policy with respect to the ugc commission should look at making this system less bureaucratic uh, in uh, just a follow up on this raga uh, based on the efforts that you are putting in and working with the universities uh, and obviously i think we need to bridge the gap and you know i think we as industry professionals owe it back to the uh, to our future to go and really spend the time with them in various ways whatever even if it's an unstructured informal way to really go back to the campuses and really help them but based on a very structured thinking that you are putting to solving the problem uh, are you are you able to see that there is a very clear uh, qual qualitative and quantitative difference in the kind of uh, talent that we are producing if, is there a kind of a before after metrics that you are able to talk about which will help us get some sense of it sure so I think the matrix has to be of two parts, as you rightly pointed out. One is from a pure play technical viewpoint. I think uh, technically these guys were well aware of what is happening. If you talk about languages and stuff like that, but the applicability of that was something which they were never told, right? They never understood. So I think what we are seeing is a huge difference in terms of their productivity, the problem solving mindset when before our program and after our program. And second part is the way they articulate things because these guys are from small towns because of their low articulation skills. A lot of times they're not being able to ask doubts, ask their peers, ask their reporting managers on what is the next step. And now because we are focusing a lot on soft skills, we are seeing a massive, massive difference in terms of the way they articulate, the way they communicate and the way they perform. So from a quantifiable viewpoint, I can tell you a guy who was, uh, 1.3, 1 1.4 and uh, from a technical viewpoint is at around 4, 3.8 to 4 at the end of our curriculum. But if you talk from a soft skill viewpoint, they were at a 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Now they are at a 2.7, 2.8. So what you are seeing is that overall their productivity has gone at least by 45 to 50%, if not more. No, I think that's a phenomenal uh, uh, data, uh, Raghav, and, and I'm glad that you're solving the problem that you are solving for the sake of the industry at large, because uh, we've been talking about it. There are multiple opinions. Uh, pretty much every discussion happens around some of these uh, so-called gaps and, and how to bridge it. 
but uh, what you are saying is very reassuring because it first of all means that there is a there is a way in which we can we can apply a systematic problem solving and solve it and you are you are able to show some numbers i think that's that's really phenomenal uh, i want to come to uh, one more key question and the, probably we'll uh, have it as the last big question for our session today uh, which is really looking at the individual contributor or the ic talent now when we look at historically how our industry has evolved in the last uh, three decades we have uh, we have probably over indexed on the whole aspect of managerial roles and we have in some sense probably glorified being a manager uh, i don't know if it is probably limited to only industry or even our societal obsessions i'm sure i have i have been in that process and i've i have i'm sure many of you have uh, as leaders been in the situation when somebody came came to me came to you and said if i don't become a manager i won't get married and and i i I'm, i'm sure those kind of jokes have done rounds uh, uh, in the uh, in the industry but the whole idea there is that people have seen the whole idea of being manager as a as a beholder of power and authority but what we don't realize is that in the context of gccs and developing products the real power and authority in knowledge industry uh, it doesn't really come from a title but it really comes from the power of ideas and having the knowledge to design systems that can have a humanity scale impact for example uh, so i'm referring to these individual contributor roles or ic roles such as system architects on the tech side and product managers on the product side so i will i want to go out on, on a limb uh, uh, for this question and make a very provocative statement that probably our future gccs will revolve around these ic talents uh, it's not just about somebody who can build a team of 400 people or 2000 people but probably it's about building an internet scale architecture or really building those zero to one products that can that can be india scale or humanity scale for example and not just the people managers there i would like to start uh, this time probably with vijay uh, so that he also gets to open the innings uh, so vijay we'd like to start with you and then we'll go to raghav and navin in terms of what is your point of view and how do you think about it do you think we have the right ic talent to really keep growing our journey and aspirations as a product nation through the gccs journey that we are undertaking there would love to hear your thoughts vijay yeah tasagat i feel like i'm finishing the t20 right now uh, but i'll give it my best <laughs> shot um so so first of all to be slightly controversial uh, so look i absolutely am in the camp that ics are the way forward for gccs and not necessarily managerial talent and i'll tell you why i think you kind of alluded to it when you kind of think about managers in gccs traditionally managers in gccs have been about managing loads and loads of people right uh so you went about saying i manage 200 people apart from the fact that it's a great ego boost it really to me means nothing at all right um so therefore we are now evolving to a model where questions are being asked in terms of what is the value add of a resource being added in a gcc right uh, so two aspects to follow one is that as we as a country look to differentiate ourselves from different other countries in terms of talent the one thing that we can really do is focus on niche skills so really the digital talent we ai ml blockchain and all of the new technologies in there if we are able to provide a very very skilled and a very very deep technical workforce i think that will uh, you know keep us good for several years to come and therefore definitely one from an opportunities perspective that's a big big thing for gc to to go after the second thing to call out to thagat is the fact that uh, you know what we touched upon retention of talent right and one of the reasons we don't retain talent is because of the question of what next so when i do let's say for example an individual contributor role there is a limited number of manager roles what next what companies have evolved to is to create a parallel career path this is not new this has been going on for some time right now but the significance of a parallel career path is you could get to a vp level being an individual contributor you're paid as much if not more than you know vp managing tons of people or whatever it is and those are the career paths that are appealing to a lot of the deep skill talent so long story short uh, for me uh, you know developing uh, ics providing them a great career path is the way forward for us to be really cutting edge in the world of gccs thanks vijay i think that's a that's a, uh, again a wonderful perspective i like the whole idea of really you emphasizing on the point that uh, since we have a limited number of managerial roles providing an alternate and a parallel parallel career path 
where they don't really, they don't have to lose the pay because that's been one of the concerns in the past that people have looked at and saying, hey, my career is going to get stalled and I will not make more. What they don't realize is like typically we, we hear of stories in the Silicon Valley, for example, that technical architect uh, might be getting more, maybe getting paid more than the manager they report into. And I think this kind of a uh, turning it's on, on its head kind of a model maybe we'll have to see. Uh, that it makes uh, sense for us because otherwise if we go with the rigid hierarchical mindset then maybe we'll never be able to untether the, the responsibilities versus the pay part of that there so uh, raghav would love to hear your thoughts on that sure so i, I think it depends uh, actually on the company so if that company that organization wants to have a very centralized system where the leadership goes to the headquarters uh, then i definitely agree that the ic roles would have a bigger impact but if you are looking to operate from a local viewpoint, you will need to empower people. You will need to empower local leadership, which cannot just be people who are uh, specialists, right? It has to have that people angle to it because after a point, you are having a huge headcount. So I, that's my personal take on it. But I would love to understand what you guys think about it. No, that's a great thing. And I'm glad that we have a divide in the house because... Uh, I think someone like Naveen, who has been uh, a veteran in the industry, would we would love to hear his thoughts on how does he see both sides of the equation? Because as as uh, as Vijay said, it makes a lot of sense for us to look at it from the IC point of view. And Raghav brought in a counterpoint there and saying that maybe if it's uh, uh, we we need to also think of in terms of really building the managerial capability there. Uh, maybe it's a horses for courses, but would love to hear your thoughts on this, uh, Naveen. Okay. So, uh, TV, I feel is um, before I get down to the IC versus manager, I want to take a precursor and say is how are global organizations looking at GCCs, right? Are they just looking at them as a low cost offshoring option so that they can get something done cheaply? I think that transition has already happened wherein they're looking at this as a value based workforce. So that's that's an important mindset change that's already in, in the play, right? Now, secondly, when we look at it, uh, but as you're trying to create this knowledge based organization, uh, and I, I think almost every other organization that I've worked with and I've interacted with, they have a very clear understanding of the job families. They have pathways for managerial role, your pathways for IC roles, and they have that clarity and people are given that option. But if I look at a dipstick measure right now and sitting across multiple promotion committees, which are there and people coming in there, how many really opt for an IC role today? As of today, when we look at it, I would say split is I mean, at best around 80, 20, where 80% of the people who make it are more in the managerial position where the 20% only because of their choice and because of whichever way and opportunities which are there, they come into an IC role. But as uh, as I say that, and I am hearing your thoughts as well on that, I think we need to start looking at a much better uh, and, and glorifying, uh, not really glorifying, to tell that it's okay. I mean, I'm not going to not get a bride because I'm not a manager is no longer, uh, is not, not not necessarily true. So you could uh, start uh, g giving these options to our employees to say that IC is all equally important role. You need to be a subject matter expert. You need to have great communication skills. You need to be able to network. You need to be able to reach out with across multiple stakeholders, still get things done. So you're not in the trenches really trying to do appraisals, trying to find out, okay, problems of leave and return to office. Those are not really the places where you work on. And today people are really working on cutting edge technologies like um, blockchain and as uh, when, uh, Vijay talked about AI, ML, quantum computing, and these are really valued skill sets. So I think we are not yet there, but we should slowly be looking at uh, people telling that my key talent is not manage people, but my key talent is the skill that I bring to the organization, which can add, add value. Sure, Naveen, I agree with that. Uh, Vijay, did you have anything else to add to this? Yeah, so so one one point, final point, TV. I think uh, to me, the debate is not so much about ICs, but the whole org structure, right? Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, Raghav kind of alluded to the point. Um, we've got to define the roles and responsibilities very, very clearly. So an IC has to be someone who does meaningful work, be it software, be it whatever. So that is one part of it. But more importantly, the person who becomes the manager doesn't become the manager because of his tenure or the fact that he does a great people management job. He is there because he or she can truly add value from a technical perspective, right? In a way, it makes a big difference from a technical perspective and is someone that an IC can look up to. And, and that's one of the reasons that ICs typically stay in organizations. And then going one level above, which is at the leadership level at director VP level, 
Uh, in GCCs, my strong point of view is that uh, we should have very clear functional ownership. Um, so things like, for example, what, you know, when I mean functional ownership, does the buck stop with you in terms of developing products? Do you have some sort of a PNL responsibility? Uh, you know, if you don't come into office, uh, is it going to make a big difference and so on and so forth? So those questions are very, very important. And the reason I'm saying that is once that organization hierarchy is set, then it makes it very easy for you or me to sell the IC role versus the manager role and so on. And so, forth. so just want to make it. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, I think it's been wonderful talking about those three really big, important issues that we talked about. We started with the uh, the initial uh, context right now with the post COVID and great resignation and uh, and the related issues of uh, how do we really keep the people motivated and engaged. We talked about the team talent in terms of how do we really hire the, uh, the, the fresh graduates there. And then we talked about the IC talent there. Uh, we are almost at the end of the time and uh, I just want to uh, take 30 seconds with each of my uh, esteemed panelists to kind of, if they had a crystal ball and if they could look into the future, we are talking about building a $5 trillion economy. We are trying to, we are talking about building a $1 trillion knowledge-based economy coming out from, from Indian economy. What do you think would be the role of human talent and human capital? What do you think would be the issues that would, that the GCC leaders and the managers in our audience should be most worried about things that we have not probably talked about in this half an hour? but things that you still feel are top of the mind and you would like to suggest to them. So, uh, Naveen, if I can start with you this time, and then we'll go to Vijay and Raghav. I think we discussed most of the points. There's no point repeating, but I'll probably give a new perspective here, uh, TV, mainly is if I look into the future, and I think we're sitting very comfortably saying that India is a wonderful uh, uh, place for uh, uh, the skill being available and GCs are investing, and I think you're adding a large number of GCs. Also, uh, what I see uh, is beyond India, it's now actually going to become a global workforce. And uh, now we're talking about pay parity almost coming in. You also need to be looking at other countries which could become destinations of choice to our GCCs. And uh, it could be in Southeast Asia, it could be somewhere uh, uh, in, in other continents as well. But they are looking at many other, play, uh, other, other options where um, they can provide the kind of uh, redundancy in terms of providing the workforce over there. So we need to be prepared. Uh, as we look, we are definitely uh, somebody, somebody to reckon with. Uh, we uh, People recognize the kind of talent that we bring over here. Uh, but I'm sure it's a very dynamic landscape. Um, and we should make the best of it and be able to make our stamp in the future. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Naveen. Uh, Raghav, would you like to share? Sure. So I think uh, for the GCCs, the biggest problem would be the startup ecosystem that this country has. And the way it is growing as it is solving problems for the global, uh, from, from across the world, right? You will see that these startups are aggressing more, uh, more, more aggressively, hiring more aggressively. And that will be a problem for GCCs to match with the culture, not just the compensation, but with the culture and the purpose as you guys were reflecting. So I think the startups would be a big problem for GCCs. Probably it's a good problem to have because that's kind of a redistribution of the talent. And I think anything that really challenges our system probably is a good thing for us because it's, it's bringing the best out of our own uh, our own capabilities. Uh, Vijay, your thoughts on that? Sure. So so three things. Uh, one is um, I would say how would how do you get GCCs to think about more than just talent and think about some very measurable KPIs around the business. And, and what I'm specifically talking about is things like how many products are being exclusively shipped out of your GCC every year? How many patents are you getting? Uh, because if you're talking of high skill talent, uh, maybe patents is one way of looking at it. So rather than talking about I've grown my GCC by 300 people this year, we talk about how many products have we shipped and you know how many patents we've got. So that's one aspect to it. The second aspect to it is if I really wish I, I want to see more sort of uh, CXO positions being held by GCCs. It has started, but it's just a handful of GCCs that have CXO positions based in India. I'd like to see much, much more of that in the future. And, you know, it's a separate debate as to what we need to do to get there. The third part of it is I think the target in this whole debate, uh, it's been centered around tech and AIML, right? Whereas I think, uh, you know, GCCs need to probably diversify a lot more. Look at things like, you know, operations, finance, strategy, and play much more of a pivotal role over there. 
rather than just beating up the whole tech story because i think we're kind of saturating from that perspective so those are things yeah yeah I, i think your last point vijay you you kind of spoke my heart because i'm a strong believer that until we really start bringing out the liberal arts and the social and the human sciences talent uh, i still feel that our gcc story is complete i mean if we are really bringing the economist and the psychologist and the sociologist and the uh, and the and the people who really have a understanding and a pulse on the uh, finger on the pulse really that's when we are really building the products from a completely zero to one kind of a scenario and that's probably the kind of gcc journey that might be a, a great opportunity for some of us to do that well i am um, i think we are we are on time so would like to thank all of you navin vijay and raghav for taking your time out and sharing all your wonderful thoughts with us uh, i hope it's been uh, helpful to all of us uh, all of the listeners uh, the whole idea of this debate was to really have an unplugged debate where we really were looking at decoding the talent strategies and and i hope it gave uh, all of you some perspective some ideas about what you would like to do um uh, monday morning so with that we'll we'll uh, sign off from here thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. so much